Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our Zoom event. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jett. I'm a correspondent governor here at the FCC and Asia editor for NBC News. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it uh, since we have a lot to talk about, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions from our viewers as well. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us here today Carrie Brown, uh, the author of the new book, She, A Study in Power. Uh, he's the professor of he's a professor of Chinese studies and director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London, as well as an associate in the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. Um, yeah, so I'll just ask a few questions to to start off with, and then we welcome questions from viewers as well. Um, you can uh, email those to us, and I'll be getting those throughout this hour. Um, so. Just to start off with, um, uh, Carrie, uh, you argue in your book that she is often misunderstood in the West. Can you tell us a bit about some of the misconceptions that you think there are around him? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's probably a big focus on him as an individual, which I can understand. I mean, in propaganda in contemporary China, he's pretty central his personality, his story, Xi Jinping thought. I mean, you can't really escape him. However, um, what's often not spoken about is the organization that he represents and the enormous institutional powers that that has now. I mean, the Communist Party of China. Um, you know, he's compared to Mao Zedong. Xi Jinping is the new Mao, people say. But I suppose what's less understood is that the Communist Party of China under Mao Zedong was much less effective, had much less institutional history and was way um, less kind of um, coherent than the thing that exists today. I, I mean, the 95, 96 million members of the party and their kind of cultural connectivity there. Uh, sort of common, um, you know, set of ideas, the bonding between them. I mean, this is not the same as that which existed even 30, 40 years ago. And so I, I think if you leave that out of the picture, I mean, it, it's hard to kind of really assess what sort of a leader she is. I mean, Xi Jinping is a powerful leader because he leads an extremely powerful political organization and an extremely powerful country, which is very different to the one that existed even you know, in the 1990s. I mean, China today is completely different to, you know, the country that I first went to in 1991 and that probably some of your, core, you know, kind of people attending today were familiar with in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So the context of his power, I think, is important. But a lot of the time, of course, the story about him that I think is publicised in a lot of English language media anyway is overwhelmingly about him as a figure who's, you know, annexing power left, right and centre. And uh, I mean, sure, I mean, as an individual, I guess he's doing that, but he's doing it in the context of uh, a political organisation, which he, in the end, has to serve and make sustainable long after he's disappeared from the scene. And I think that point needs to be made again and again and again. Um, and again, for our audience, if you would like to send in your own questions for later in this hour, um, the email address is question at fcchk.org. Um, and so I think you actually uh, met Xi back in 2007 when he came to Liverpool as uh, part of a Shanghai delegation. Um, what was that like and what were your impressions? Did you have any sense back then that he would become the kind of leader he is yeah. now? So, I mean, actually, I, I met him as part of a Liverpool uh, delegation which I was working as an advisor for at the time in Shanghai when he was party secretary. I and mean, he, he didn't, and I think he's been to Britain. He's only been to Britain once, and that was in 2015 in the kind of ill-fated golden age period, um, which we can speak about maybe later. Um, I mean, you know, party leaders are always, I found as a diplomat and then as an academic and you know, kind of working in China quite a bit, uh, they're well briefed. They are very well trained. I think that's the difference between a politician in China and a politician in the outside world. I mean, they do train their politicians for good or bad. Um, and so, you know, there wasn't really 
an easy way of assessing this figure that I met um, briefly in 2007. You know, was he going to be the person he is today? I mean, it's impossible to say. I mean, he certainly was confident. And I think people that have met him subsequently, I mean, I've talked obviously to um, diplomats and uh, politicians and other you know, delegation leaders and what have you. And I think they're all kind of quite struck by the fact that this is a very confident person, an ex um, foreign minister of a country told me that, you know, he has the full sort of suite of political kind of um, abilities. He can work a room. They saw him on a kind of diplomatic visit, you know, kind of basically glad, glad hand a, a bunch of uh, business people and other public figures. I think this was in in America when he went there a few years ago. Um, the book uh, that I've written about, see, I mean, I think um, because the Communist Party of China is so protective and secretive and regards that as an important thing to control information flows, and of course you guys have to deal with that every day, um, it's very hard to sort of peer between the kind of cracks and try and see anything within. Um, and I just tend to go on the kind of visible things. And the visible things that I see in Xi Jinping is it is pretty clear that within the context that he has power, he's effective. I mean, he has been effective till now anyway. Whether he continues to be effective, that's a big question. We can talk about that because I think there's worrying signs that it might um, you know, not be the case uh, as much now. But in the last 10 years, you know, he has been really an effective leader of the Communist Party of China, and that's the only benchmark that he really needs to care about. Is there a person underneath this that we could relate to and make friends with and, you know, kind of see? Yeah, I mean, he's a human being, I don't deny that. Um, but you have to remember that the whole training of Communist Party cadres at this level is almost like a sort of Jesuitical kind of annihilation of the self, you know, I think that's how someone described it, you know, that from the day you really commit to the party, you are committing to a, a sort of very collective ethos within that party and basically just being an obedient, faithful servant. It's not unlike, I believe, you know, someone becoming a priest in the Catholic Church. You know, you it's not about you, it's about your mission. And you almost become, I guess, sort of not... <laughs> Not physically celibate, but you become almost look sort of personality celibate. <laughs> you know, you it's not about, you know, that you've got interest, that you've got kind of a hinterland. No, you know, I mean, Xi Jinping, when he refers to books he's read, when he refers to interests he's got, every single thing has a political meaning. And he goes to Russia and talks about all the Russian novels he's read. I doubt whether he's read any of these novels, but he's doing it to be friendly. When he displays some kind of interest in football or these things it's just almost like a sort of diplomatic gesture and I think this is um, obviously kind of quite irritating to outsiders they want to see the real she but I would sort of maintain that the real she is what you see I mean it's that's what you know that's what he is this completely uh, loyal instrumental faithful servant of the communist party who is no longer really um, of the Xi Jinping that may have begun this journey many years ago, and the Xi Jinping back then may have wanted and had agency to join the party, but now, many decades later, he is, you know, a consummate um, servant of that party and a fulfiller of its collective vision. So, I mean, that's not easy to relate to as a person. Now, of course, we all just saw uh, Xi secure a historic third term as leader at the 12th Party Congress which was very well choreographed. Um, one moment that got a lot of attention was on the last day when Hu Jintao was escorted out of the hall. And you, you talk about trying to peer into the cracks and obviously this is all speculation, but I'm, I'm curious uh, to know what your take was on, on what happened there, if, if there's any way to know. Yeah, I mean, so all one can say is what one saw and it wasn't great. I mean, in terms of, just demonstrating empathy and, you know, care for this perhaps quite confused and uh, frail old man. Um, and, you know, it wasn't exactly a great show for the party. So I don't, my kind of initial impulse would be to think this is not some huge designed pre-planned -pre humiliation, largely because I think Hu Jintao as a political player has long been absent. I mean, really, his 
last real influence was a decade ago. So what's the point of, you know, kind of humiliating him? The idea of a Hu, Hu Jintao network. Well, uh, yeah, through the China Youth League, I guess there's people that are linked to that, but I don't see it as being particularly coherent. That's not going to think that would kind of um, threaten the current core leadership around Xi, who've been well kind of modelled and formed by the things they've been through in the last 10 years. Um, I suppose it um, does show uh, how, you know, kind of um, the, the, the kind of leadership are just very controlling. I mean, all that you did see that day was extremely controlling behaviour. Um, and it's interesting that of the whole few kind of days of the Congress, I mean, that was the one moment when you saw anything you could relate to as, as human, you know, some frailty and uh, uh, maybe someone who had ill health or even dementia, you know, kind of, it's sort of just say that, you know, that, that, that might explain it. Um, I guess the more worry, I mean, to me, if we were looking at struggles within the party, and this has been a rumor for the last year, you know, Li Keqiang having a big you know, kind of pushback against Xi and these sorts of things, I think it would be quite um, reassuring. I mean, it would show in a sense that this sort of group of people is, um, uh, you know, there's still sort of some kind of scrappiness about it and some uh, potential inefficiency even, and that's very human. I guess the thing that I find unsettling is I don't really see any of that. The Li Keqiang rumours I thought were quite um, comforting in a way, but I don't think that they uh, really proved anything. I, I, I mean, I don't think it looked like there was any real um, kind of substan substantial truth to them. Um, I think even this kind of Hu Jintao episode, I mean, it's like it would be nice to think that there were actual real kind of desperate arguments in the party, but I don't think there are. I mean, I think it's kind of the eerie thing, as, as again I say in the book, is this kind of hugely complicated question that we, we deal with every day, you know, the development of China as a global power, as an incredibly complicated economy, socioeconomically getting more and more complicated, vast disparities between people's, you know, kind of wealth levels, cultural levels, whatever you want to talk in China about, you see diversity. And it's become this story of one guy and one organization with one viewpoint and a kind of very uniform set of policies. And if that is the case, if that really is the case, wow, this shows the kind of liquidity and malleability of humans, doesn't it? That you can dominate this story with this kind of setup. Or uh, there is something underneath all of this that actually is more complicated and um, potentially disruptive that we're missing. You know, and I think that kind of haunts us all, that we're sort of looking at this extremely uniform monolithic leadership and there's something here that we're missing, the sign that actually it's quite brittle and fragile and it's all going to kind of blow up. Now, in 10 years, that hasn't happened. I mean, it might happen tomorrow, but it looks less likely by the day. What I'm puzzled by and continue to be puzzled by is the rigid uniformity of this political narrative and how it doesn't seem like anything is standing in its way. And I don't think that's just about Xi Jinping. I mean, he may be an extremely effective politician, but can't all be because of him. There must be something deeper. And the only thing that I have thought of is the compelling, uh, you know, kind of significance of nationalism and the tangibility of what nationalism wants to aim for and achieve. The fact that, you know, China is in within reach of proving, you know, its great modern power, uh, prowess, that these things really do kind of, you know, mobilize people and drive everything else. Apart from that, I can't see any other real reason for why this story of such complexity and richness and diversity, at least politically, has become so crushingly uniform and boring. And what I saw in the new leadership this week, uh, you know, just finally, is really seven incredibly boring, uninteresting people who you grapple with to make kind of interesting things about. And there just doesn't seem to be anything there. She's very unsettling. Are there any risks to that? As she seems to be surrounded by fewer and fewer people who might challenge him. Um, what, what could that mean for his ability to lead going forward? 
Well, I remember uh, you, some some people listening in may uh, have known Leo Goodstadt, the late Leo Goodstadt, who was based in Hong Kong many years. I think from the early 60s, he went there as an administrator for the Hong Kong government. And then I think he was a high level official in the late British administration and then stayed on. And Leo Goodstadt, um, I remember meeting him some years ago in Hong Kong for a breakfast. And he made this comment about the Communist Party of China has no ethical system. And I was puzzled by it for you know, a long time. Um, I was really puzzled by this comment and thought about it. I mean, I think actually it, it does happen. It probably doesn't have a moral system, but it has an ethical system because I think it believes the ends always justify the means. And I think if there's one thing that's consistent throughout its behavior and the Maoist period onwards is if you say what the ends are, you justify everything driving towards those ends. So it believes both in ends and in you know, the means to achieve those ends. And they have been broadly nationalistic from, since day one, although of course they've changed in form and shape and scope. Now, the thing about the Xi leadership is we know the nationalistic ends and we see in policies a kind of you know, justification because the majority are looked after. Now, zero COVID is a great example. You have a leadership who like Li Chang, you know, the, the kind of elevated number two in the hierarchy now who may be premier next year. Uh, a man associated with the first really brutal lockdown spot, along with Xi'an, um, Shanghai earlier um, this year. You see horrifying stories over the weekend in Ho Ha Ha to in Inner Mongolia of a lady committing suicide, literally walked into a building. You kind of feel with this zero COVID, it's important because it's highly representative of, representative of this, the means you know the, the ends justify the means the end is you know not having any pandemic the means are you just lock places down no matter what until the whole thing is eradicated and i think that that is obviously for enlightenment uh, westerners like ourselves or my, myself at least um very um kind of antagonizing and and sort of hard you think of the individual suffering and you think well that that can't be justified but I think the party kind of constantly says, well, you know, we are looking after the good of the majority of the people. And that justifies it, even if, you know, one percent of the population goes to hell. That's, you know, 99 percent are OK. Uh, and that language about eradicating extreme poverty, I think that's part of it. The fact that, you know, they are really looking to kind of um, get a legitimacy and justification from, you know, the majority of the population. Now, one of the things I guess that is very difficult to explain outside of China is that despite the fact I think there are significant groups of people in China now who are not happy with zero COVID, with the economy, with the housing market, I mean these things, and they may be hundreds of millions, I mean you know two, three hundred million, there's still a, a significant minority. And if you look at the populist messages of this part, you know, kind of under Xi Jinping, the avuncular kind of public persona he has, the nationalistic sort of language he uses, I suspect that for the majority that still has impact and reach and, you know, kind of gives this leadership legitimacy. Um, this is obviously very difficult to kind of grapple with because I'm not denying that there must be very significant antagonisms and anger and a sort of feeling of real worry about politics in China by Chinese people. But I also can imagine that it is still uh, tenable to say that for the majority, this is still a popular leadership because it's so vast, the kind of you know public that you're looking at. And for the party's moral kind of calculus, well, you just need the majority on your side and for the minorities, you do what you need to, um, but your justification is that the majority is still happy. And obviously for, uh, you know, liberal kind of views, that's not good. But China feels that the liberal West is in such a parlous and awful state now that it doesn't have any voice in this. And so I think it's reinforced in this view that the ends always justify the means. So we shouldn't expect any change to the zero COVID or dynamic zero COVID policies anytime soon, because there, there have been rumors that have sent the markets up and down and China reaffirmed this weekend there won't be any change. Um, is, what, 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 what if my argument is right, that the ends justify the means, I'm suspecting that I, I don't think we will see quick changes, even though you know we'll probably see more and more anger. Um, what I worry about is that 
the, the images that we see, obviously, in the outside world that interest us are in those who are suffering because of zero COVID. And we may get a disproportionate idea of how much opposition she is facing. I, again, say, you know, Xi Jinping is facing opposition, but I don't know whether it's significant. I think it's um, likely that it's not significant. So we have a disconnect between the perceptions of that kind of unrest or opposition in China and what actually it might really be. And I think with the leadership we've seen, they are the most brutal and blatant statement of this leadership believes it's on the right track and there's gonna be no compromise. And they're not economists, they are politicians. Uh, there's no economists in this new standing committee. Those are significant pieces of information for the kind of leadership that we're looking at. Um, I wanna get into a, a couple of issues. First of all, being in Hong Kong, um, of course, I wanna talk about that. Uh, she was in Hong Kong uh, in July 1st for the hand, on July 1st for the handover anniversary. He gave a speech emphasizing his support for one country, one country, two systems. Um, where do you think Hong Kong fits into his plans for the next five years? Well, these days I'm in a happy position, well, or said ironically, so the unhappy position of saying things that I personally really dislike saying, but I think are true. <laughs> so, you know, I think a definition of the truth is something that is the case whether you like it or not. For Hong Kong, I think the government has made it pretty clear under Xi Jinping that uh, its moral authority, which it always thought it had for Hong Kong, even, you know, way back in the, uh, you know, 20th century, even before, um, the, the way before the handover for, you know, kind of the people of Hong Kong, means that once more uh, it's dealing with the majority uh, um, responsive and uh, accord with that um, you know kind of moral authority from Beijing and believe themselves to be patriotic and faithful Chinese and then it's sort of dealing with a um, fractious uh, you know kind of um, foreign kind of influenced and therefore contaminated minority that it can deal with as it pleases and the outside world again has no moral authority to tell it what to do. So um, I think where I'm sitting in Hong Kong, obviously that would be a disastrous situation to be in because your you know, sense of autonomy and difference is eroded by the day. But if you think of you know, the kind of story uh, of China itself, its mission, its nationalistic kind of uh, dreams, the Xi Jinping sort of ethos of the party, it's becoming more and more a kind of minority story. Um, the only thing that might have impacted on that story was that economically Hong Kong would have caused pain to China and you know not performed in ways that it needed to. Um, that's not the case. It's continued to perform, maybe not as brilliantly as was wanted, but certainly it's not collapsed. And so I think while in London and elsewhere, Hong Kong is given a high status uh, as an issue, I don't think that that's reciprocated in Beijing. It's um, a sorted issue. Um, there is, you know, no kind of desire to have uh, a place which is vastly different from the rest of China. It's being kind of normalized. I say, I don't particularly like reporting this. I mean, and I think it's, you know, abhorrent in many ways what's happened, but I think it's um, what would make sense in Beijing if I was Xi Jinping, if I could use my intuition, I would look at this and think, well, this is our issue now. Uh, the 50 years was sort of like, you know, a, a symbolic thing. We can now after 23, 24 years of the handover, no, 25 years of the handover say, this is our show now, you know, and you lot can just butt out. And I think that's what we've seen. Um, turning to Taiwan, uh, which has been very much in the news lately. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, especially in the U.S., of a time what the, what kind of timeline China might be operating on. Um, even though, as far as I know, China has never shared any kind of official timeline. Um, what do you think will be Xi's approach to Taiwan in his third term? Well, I think a lot of what we see in domestic Chinese politics today, ironically, is deeply influenced and shaped by what's happening in the outside world, because China is a global power, but also because I think China is um, disrupted slightly 
by the fact that the outside world has become a source of unpredictability, unlike in the past where it was the other way around. When I was a diplomat, you know, we were always thinking about China's instability and, you know, we were the stable ones. And now uh, we've changed around. You've got, um, you know, elections in uh, America and Britain and Brazil consistently sort of, you know, kind of split populations, you know, 50-50. Um, and you've had events which have been pretty disruptive in the last few years in the outside world. So I think that has impacted on Xi's leadership. I do not think that Xi Jinping would be the leader he is today without the outside, outside world being the way it is. Um, and certainly the great economic crisis of 2008 and then events since then, I think have shaped the platform for Xi-style politics and made China more nationalistic and more dependent on its stability. Now for Hong Kong, uh, for Taiwan, um, I think that the trigger would be elections in 2024 on Taiwan and in America, because I think they obviously introduce uh, big unknowns. If a Taiwanese president were elected to replace Tsai Ing-wen, he's been relatively prudent and careful on this issue, and were to have a stronger line on autonomy or even independence, well, then we have a massive problem. If in America, a presidential candidate um, were elected in 2024, uh, who had also a more adventurous, uh, forceful policy on Taiwan and wanted to recognize um, Taiwan or not recognize the one China policy, yep, we have a problem. If those two things don't happen, I don't think there is an incentive for uh, China at the moment beyond saying harsh things and continuing to isolate Taiwan uh, diplomatically, uh, you know, in other ways, um, to take the risks of something, you know, much more forceful. Russia, Ukraine has proved that even land wars are highly risky. It's also proved that you can end up with a bigger mess than the one you started with. An amphibious landing, as we all know, is way more difficult and there's no big signs, as far as I understand from analysts, military analysts, that China is really ramping things up to prepare for that. Um, so I'm not complacent about the, uh, you know, ways in which the Xi Jinping leadership on this issue could be highly uh, emotional, or, or not emotional, but they could be highly responsive to provocations from the outside world. And there are plenty of people in the outside world that want to provoke them. However, I think that if that didn't happen, uh, you would have China committed to a view which is this issue is going China's way in the long term. And that, you know, it just has to wait uh, as the outside world, in particular, America and its alliance system get weaker and China gets stronger. And um, this issue will eventually come China's way. Um, and what that means in terms of what an eventual reunification would look like, well, who knows? At the heart of that, um, I think there is going to always be this massive issue of the fact that 23 million people on Taiwan do not recognize um, uh, you know, an outcome uh, in which they are reunified under any shape or form. And that's going to be you know, always a massive problem. So I think it's going to be a constant battle to try and make, maintain the status quo on this issue. That will get more difficult, but I think it's just about maintainable at the moment, unless an American or a Taiwanese president in particular, newly elected, decides to become much more adventurous. Then we do have really terrible scenarios. Um, that kind of leads me into my next question, which is what do you think are the biggest challenges for Xi and the party in the next five years. And you also mentioned uh, worrying signs earlier in terms of whether she can continue to be an effective leader. Could you tell us a bit about those? Yeah, so with this leadership that came out trooping out, and some of you no doubt followed it closely, and you know some people were right in their kind of predictions and others weren't, um, in October, the new Politburo Standing Committee. I mean, I guess the thing that was most obvious is there's no economists there. And um, you know there are people with some experience of running like Shanghai, as Li Chang has, does, has done since 2017, or Beijing, as Tai Chi has done. Um, but, you know, it, not really people that you would say had a portfolio, economic portfolio of any significance in their careers. And um, 
yeah, I think their biggest challenges are economic, of course. You know, they're, they're already in really tough um, situation. Growth is probably above 3%. It might be a bit above 5%, you know, 4 four to 5% for the whole year, but um, it's, it's obviously going down. I mean, it's getting tighter and tighter. And the housing market is not great. And um, 70%, I think, of China's wealth is tied up with the housing market. In America, it's half of that. It's about 30%. So, you know, this is an enormously vulnerable sector. Um, you have zero COVID still impacting heavily on, um, you know, supply route lines and all the rest of it. Um, you have unemployment um, and you have an outside world, which is not a great kind of um, ally at the moment, you know, politically and economically. And it's moving into its own really, really tough economic situation. So um, that seems to me that this is, you know, the Politburo are going to have to deal with some pretty tough issues around the economy, despite not really being economists. So, I mean, that's that's the first issue. The second issue is that they've set up an aspirational, ambitious program of environmental, public health and social welfare reform. This has been stated again and again and again. I know the timeline for achieving a lot of this might not be until the 2030s, but as the last summer showed with pretty harrowing um, droughts and heat waves in Chongqing and other areas of China, the climate change issues are obviously becoming more and more critical. Um, and whether COP27 is going to achieve some big breakthrough, I think already there's a sense that we're going to have to adapt to a world which has got hotter and is going to get hotter. Um, and that China's ambitious aims are not ambitious enough. So there's a big, big burden for the government there. And I think the final thing is its relations with uh, particularly America are um, awful uh, and getting worse. Um, its diplomacy is, um, it was going to be tough. I mean, I think it, it, for China to rise, to have the political system it does and be the kind of country it is, was always going to be a big challenge, but it's in the worst of all worlds in a way because it has these differences and it's dealing with America, which I think is, to be honest, looking like it's either confused or panicking. So this is really an awful combination. Um, and it's doing it with a style of diplomacy, which is often, so it seems to me quite self-defeating. Uh, one year's continuation with a foreign uh, policy portfolio, even though he's in his seventies is interesting. I mean, the idea of stability, but he's not really the world's best communicator of foreign policy. Um, and you also have all sorts of anomalous things like uh, the Russia kind of link, even though it seems that Russia is doing things that make China's life harder. Uh, you do have, however, one thing that I suppose we often forget, um, which is that under Xi Jinping, like it or not, for these tough issues, there is only one person we, as the outside world, have to do a deal with. So I often think, you know, the Chancellor of Germany went to China in the last few days and kind of did this sort of thing where he basically got Xi Jinping to agree that a nuclear resolution to the Ukraine war, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine would not be something China would support. This is important. I mean, we have to remember that in a grim scenario, we do have this thing that if we get one person to agree, uh, whose name is Xi Jinping, it will happen. Uh, and in scrappier situations, that would be far, far, far uh, scarier. So that at least we have. Um, for those who are watching, don't forget to send in your questions to question at fcchk.org. Um, I'll turn to those in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask about the, the worrying signs that you mentioned uh, on top of the challenges. Is, is there anything particular about Xi that you think uh, maybe doesn't bode well? Well, structurally, I think it's worrying that um, he is dominant in the way he is. Now, I mean, it's not, I wanna make clear that I think that's possibly not even an intentional thing. Yeah, politicians always want as much power as they can have, but I think, Structurally, the Communist Party of China seems to sort of uh, have this, um, you know, kind of natural bias to people being able to accrue these, you know, kind of all, enormous amounts of influence and power. And um, in the end, it's sort of self-destructive. Now, it's, um, 
worrying that there's no real sign of a successor, not because at the age of 69, Xi Jinping might at the moment need someone to step in um, imminently. But I mean, you know, uh, anything could happen. And I'm not clear what does happen if he is indisposed. I mean, if there's a health issue or something else. Um, so that's quite unsettling in this group uh, that have just emerged. There's no one who really looks like a, they're being groomed for um, being a, an important, you know, kind of leader to replace him in the future. Um, and to say that they're going to leave it until the next time means, well, when he's 74, she might kind of think of having a successor, but that's uh, quite a long way away. So I think that's worrying. Um, and I also think quality of decision making, um, uh, you know, it's um, so, so I think others have argued this too, like Martin Wolf in the Financial Times. I mean, you know, politicians are like kind of performance in every other field, you know, they have their peaks and then they have a decline. I mean, I think Xi Jinping's been an effective leader of the Communist Party of China, at least for China's, um, you know, sort of internal issues and its global role um, for 10 years. Um, but, you know, it, it, this is a really, really tough job. Can this be maintained without really, really incredible uh, advisory network around him and without him having the same ability to kind of judge things correctly? I mean, that's really, really questionable. Um, and I don't know whether the COVID, uh, zero COVID kind of approach is a kind of sign of this, um, you know, quality of decision making declining. I mean, I, when one looks at it and looks at its social costs, its economic costs and reputationally how this looks outside of China, it's really questionable whether this policy um, is sensible. I mean, especially as the rest of the world now, I mean, Taiwan, Japan have all opened up. Um, you, you know, most countries now, they're just living with COVID. Um, I understand the rationale a year ago when hospitalization and low vaccination rates and all the rest of it meant China was extremely cautious. But today, I mean, this looks more and more of an anomaly. Is this symptomatic of a leadership that has kind of lost its political touch? Well, it might be, and if it is, uh, again, that all kind of um, centralizing decision making for big decisions in this sort of leadership, um, it means it's extremely vulnerable to one or two bad calls from one person. So um, what I said just before about, well, we can do a deal with this guy because there's only one guy who's being a positive thing in some ways, uh, in this area is definitely not a positive thing. It's quite worrying. So it's an extremely mixed blessing that you have a centralized sort of decision making capacity but it's all reliant on whether the person at the centre makes good decisions or not. And everyone makes bad decisions. The implication of that for C when he makes a bad decision is it's just much, much uh, more uh, kind of impact than anyone else. Um, I want to get to some questions from our uh, viewers. Um, we have a good question here from our member, Alan Yu. Uh, he says, several years down the road, have you changed your mind about what you wrote in your previous book, The World According to Xi? Is there anything you would like to update or expand? Um, no, I mean, I think the central argument of that and other things that I've written about Xi is this idea of the Communist Party being so important and his relationship with the party being important. And I think I, I haven't changed that. I mean, I guess now I'm obviously kind of thinking, as many people are, about this question, which I think was referred to by a a Chinese who had emigrated to America uh, that had known Xi Jinping when he was young and um, was interviewed by an American embassy official in one of the WikiLeaks papers that was leaked in 2009, I think it was. And they made this comment about how Xi Jinping is not corruptible by money, but may be corruptible by power. And I have to say, I, I looked at this in, in writing the sort of the newest book on Xi um, um, and it kind of struck me that that was uh, uh, maybe a kind of quite prophetic comment, um, because I think it, 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 she, his family networks, the things that were exposed by you know Bloomberg and others uh, before he came to power. I mean, she was always quite careful about controlling. It seems his family and his family networks, and um, it wasn't as huge a problem, for instance, as others, you know, kind of elite families like Wen Jiabao. Or, or obviously Zhou Yong Kang being the kind of biggest one. Um, however, this issue of corruptibility of power 
I think is um, is more kind of um, suitable for looking at Xi. And I don't know, you know, at what point, as I've just sort of said, um, the kind of overwhelming status being given to him in this system actually is something no one could defend themselves against. It's like someone in the end of the sort of Maoist period, I think the late um, uh, Sydney um, uh, uh, guard um, Rittenberg, um, I remember him sort of describing Mao Zedong in the sort of early 70s when he met him or he saw him at some event, looking overwhelmed with disappointment at how things had turned out because he just couldn't manage uh, the expectations that had been put on him and the system almost kept him a prisoner. And I think with Xi Jinping, it's a little bit the sort of, it's like it might kind of go that way too, that he's literally, we he might or might not want all this power, but because he's just been given it, um, it becomes overwhelming and, and almost sort of destroys you. So I think that that's something I pay a lot of attention to. And as I say, uh, with this new leadership, the removal of Hu Chunhua and Wang Yang, um, Li Keqiang, you know, these are people who were kind of maybe at least had a little bit of status. It's just a bit more possible that Xi Jinping may be ultimately corruptible by power. The problem is the stakes are so high and the outcome from that would be just devastating. So we just have to hope it's not happening. But I think it's something that's more possible now than I thought maybe a year or 18 months ago. Um, speaking of the new leadership, uh, we have another question from Alan. Li Qiang is an MBA graduate from a university in Hong Kong. Is this an indication of Xi's intention to be more business friendly in the next five years compared with the last two or three? Yeah, I mean, the business friendly uh, Communist Party leaders is always comforting, comforting. And, and then you, you kind of really wonder, what does that mean? I, I guess these are people that are, look at the market and uh, business and the economy as political tools. And I think we should never forget that. They, use the language of the market and you know economics but their aims are are very political um you know it's the market not for the market's sake but for the what the market can deliver to sustainable communist party rule so it, it, you know that's not the aim of a capitalist economy for sure so li chang yeah i mean he's got this uh, degree uh, from uh, hong kong but i think he did it by correspondence um and he did it while he was i believe in uh Zhejiang. I think, um, and was actually, I think uh, Xi Jinping's sort of chief of staff or, you know, kind of the secretary of the central committee uh, in Zhejiang or something like that. So, you know, working presumably quite closely with him. Um, does this mean that he's going to be business friendly? I mean, this sort of what we hope, I think we hope because of his time in Shanghai and as such a sort of important business city, you know, we hope that he's business friendly. Um, some material came out in the media of his sort of past comments about, you know, being business friendly to, uh, you know, kind of entrepreneurs in, in Jiang. He was um, in, in Jiang, so I believe, where he was a, an official before going briefly um, to, to Shanghai. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what you can see is someone, however, who is prized for their loyalty to Xi and by that, um, their ability to take on um, significant vested interest in order to deliver the objectives of the Xi leadership. Um, when you look at the, um, you know, kind of clampdowns or the lockdowns against COVID in Shanghai, I mean, they kind of, to me, disrupted one idea I had that uh, Xi Jinping really pays attention to the you know, urban service sector working, you know, kind of middle class and, and Shanghai is the ultimate place for those in China. Um, the fact that Li Chang was able to uh, and willing to you know, go for that group um, and antagonize them and anger them, you know, guess shows that in this leadership, no one is, you know, privileged, you know, it's definitely for the people, right? And not for any particular group. Um, and I, I don't know what that means, therefore, for the sort of business agenda. I think for business people, um, they just have to recognize that in this environment, the political goal of creating a rejuvenated, great, powerful, strong China is the thing that drives everything. And the assumption is that the Xi leadership uh, with a you know kind of coherent, highly disciplined and mobilized Communist Party, uh, you know, uh, kind of under him and his kind of leadership 
is the tool to realize that. And, you know, business or all other kind of groups, um, if they sit within that narrative and contribute to that, they will be um, accepted. But they should never think that they have some kind of agency or platform of their own. So, I mean, that's just, I think, a statement of the political reality of contemporary China that everyone from academics to business people to foreign leaders has to think about. The aim is so clearly set. You have to perform according to that. And if you can, well, then you have a place. And if you can't, then you have to think of alternatives. Um, I have a related question from Adrian Valenzuela who asks, can she manage the complexity of the country without prioritizing economic growth? Um, I think it's likely if the economic um, growth uh, continues to be poor or even China goes into a recession, um, which we have to remember, China in a recession is a very, very unusual thing. I mean, I guess there was a recession in the late 80s before the Tiananmen Square uprising, you, you know, and, Obviously, that's the sort of exception that proves the rule. If you have a re recession in China, you, you know, the outcomes can be very dramatic. Um, before that, you know, I think a recession is an unknown thing and afterwards it's been an unknown thing. So the China politically in which there's a recession is an unknown country. Now, I think that this leadership are going to definitely ramp up nationalism if the country is in a very straightened economic circumstances and in a sense that's already kind of happening um that means that um you know you can mobilize people by telling them to sacrifice for the greater good of you know the rejuvenated nation which is still over the horizon but you know it's, it's still going to happen um you also kind of blame the outside world for causing these problems you know classic sort of uh, you know nationalistic um thing that we we see everywhere really um and you also, you know, kind of just ask for people to, um, you, you know, kind of um, do more, act more, you know, try to contribute more to the great nationalistic goals. Um, that China is obviously going to be very problematic for the outside world. I mean, Chinese nationalism is something that makes people very uneasy anyway and has for a long, long time. Uh, but a Chinese nationalism in the scenario where China may well become the world's largest economy at some point in the next 10 um, you know, years or less, yeah, that's going to be a much, much bigger geopolitical problem. So, uh, you know, a, a kind of falling Chinese economy um, does not necessarily mean a China which is more compliant and more kind of biddable and weaker. It may well mean a China which is much harsher in its rhetoric, much more assertive in its nationalism, and uh, geopol geopolitically a much, much bigger problem. So, <laughs> We may not like a China which is economically strong, but I suspect we're going to have even more problems with a China which is economically weaker. Um, we do have time for, for a few more questions if anyone wants to send them in. Uh, it's question at fcchk.org. Um, but in, in the meantime, uh, one thing I've been thinking about a bit is, you know, we've had only 10 years of Xi, we've had many more of that with Putin. Um, do you see any parallels between the two of them or are they on completely different paths? What do you make of their relationship? Well, I think um, you have to remember that Russia's economy is I think a sixth the size of China's economy. So I mean, that fact alone I think is hugely important. Um, they're, they're not um, comparable in many ways. Um, and I don't think China sees itself as a peer of Russia. I mean, I think its psychology is to think of Russia as a necessary partner because of their massive shared border. Um, and also a partner which is important because, you know, it is also not a great ally of the West Russia. So, you, you know, kind of for China, yeah, I mean, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Um, that's that's some, some of their thinking. But I think we shouldn't overplay this idea that Xi Jinping and Putin have post, you know, very close personal relationships and you know, they're, they're sort of buddies and therefore they're always going to stand by each other. Um, I think um, this idea of Xi Jinping, the friend, 
again, sort of suggests that there's a Xi Jinping which is separate from his political persona. I kind of don't think there is. I mean, you know, you can build all of the lovely relationships with China that you like and Modi and, you know, uh, India's Modi and others and, and Xi Jinping, uh, Putin have. But I mean, in the end of the day, uh, it, it, what really matters is do you or don't your friendships with China work for the country? Because um, you're dealing, obviously, with a you know a very nationalist politician in Xi Jinping, and that's what as I said several times really drives him. Um, I suspect that China thinks of Russia in quite disdainful ways. I've always found my conversations about Russia in China over the last thirty years have always been um, slightly kind of haunted by these guys always you know get it wrong these russians you know they they didn't really have a great relationship with us in the 50s and then they went and, you know de-stalinized and that was a big mistake and then they kind of you know went and collapsed the ussr in 1991 and you know they allowed all these terrible foreigners in that gave the worst possible advice and you know crashed their economy and their social welfare and everything and yeah, Putin is an okay kind of leader because at least he's, he's getting stable and made life a bit simpler for us. But at the end of the day, the Russians always seem to screw up. And I think with Putin, uh, I guess that the Chinese now would think, wow, this guy has really screwed up. I mean, he's uh, you know started this very reckless and destructive war. Um, he's not won it as quickly as he wanted to, and he's probably not going to win it um, at all now. Um, He's created probably directly or indirectly enormous stresses on the global economy. And he's also made life difficult for China. He has been useful uh, because he's distracted the world from Russia, from, from China to Russia. I mean, I think, you know, China was really standing in the firing range for a lot of powers, the Americans and their ally, allies and Europeans, you know, were really, really kind of focusing on China. And now, obviously, Ukraine and Russia, that war has. Uh, distracted a lot of geopolitical uh, attention and also I suppose he's been useful because he's shown uh, you know what a kind of aggressive move against another country looks like and how it can go badly wrong and that's I think something Chinese strategists will clearly be thinking hard about um, as they look you know to resolve some of their issues in particular Taiwan so I think uh, in that sense he's proved himself to be the classical useful idiot but I don't think that um, China regards itself remotely on the same level as Russia. I think it's appreciative of Russia's enormous uh, territorial, um, you know, kind of size and its enormous importance next to China. Um, but they've never really had, I don't think, a natural alliance. I mean, it's never been an easy relationship. It wasn't an easy relationship in the Maoist period um, at all. And it's never really been an easy relationship in the last 30 years. So I don't think we can really assume that these powers are going to be terribly, um, you know, kind of easy to work with each other. Um, what we can say about China's position, though, is whatever its views on Russia, it is not and will not fit into some sort of Western organized NATO led resolution to, uh, you know, the situation in Ukraine. No, nope, it's not going to play along with that, too. It, it definitely wants non-alignment in this and complete autonomy. So uh, I don't think we can take any comfort if it does have problems with Russia, but it's suddenly then becoming a bit friendlier to uh, you know, Europe and America. I don't think that's, it will not do that either. Um, we have a question from Julian Lim who asks, do you think that other members of the Politburo with technical qualifications such as Chen Jining will create a technoc technocracy that at least results in continued push towards modernization and prosperity even as the economy becomes politicized? Well, I mean, I think that um, the, the, in some senses that question will be answered by um, who, who's appointed to important ministerial or advisory positions. Um, so I mean, the National People's Congress next March, it'd be interesting to see, you know, kind of ministerial positions and uh, whether there's a sort of emerging technocracy that you can kind of divine in that. But also, you know, things like who replaces potentially Liu He, um, you know, the um, key economics guy for Xi, you know, is there going to be someone with as um, a kind of good a technical economic background as Liu He? If, if Liu He, you know, as is expected, um, disappears from the scene, um, you know, there's an enormous number of sort of important 
financial and um, you know kind of social technical positions from within the health service. You know the um, kind of national, I think it's health and security commission, I believe, and you know kind of groups like this where they really do need a lot of technical kind of ability and background. Um, in the past, I think that's been true. I mean, you know, this isn't a leadership that decries technical ability and uh, a specialist background. Um, the question is the relationship between that and political decision making. I mean, if you've got um, a kind of strongly specialist group of, you, you know, kind of relatively senior but not top, top rank administrators or, um, you know, kind of party people who who, you know, from technical reasons, um, believe policy should be something, but who are overruled because politically, you know, this is not acceptable. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you obviously got a problem. And I, I'm, I'm assuming in this leadership that the politics will, will always win. Now, I mean, if the politics is extremely pragmatic and flexible and very broad and Xi Jinping's, you know, kind of style of politics is broad, you know, big statements, common prosperity, dual circulation, you know, all these kind of things. They leave a lot of space for people to kind of uh, work in. Then, yeah, I guess you can have, you know, the politics and the kind of uh, you know, technical specialists, various um, relatively harmoniously aligned. But if you get this sort of insistence, um, for instance, on you know, kind of only using Chinese created vaccines, despite the fact that clinical evidence proves, I believe that uh, you know, foreign vaccines are more effective for political reasons. Um, then I think you are going to obviously have big, big problems, um, and the default will always be towards the politics in this leadership. It's, as I said, it's not, it's a leadership of people with nothing but political backgrounds um, in the standing committee now. So that's their life. That's their kind of whole, you know, kind of focus before. And I don't see any reason why in the, uh, they're all in their 60s. So why would they change that now? Um, another question about the leadership from Jackie Donaldson. Why do you think there are no women, not just in the standing committee, but in the Politburo at all? Yeah, I mean, this is really, I think from the 90s, there's not, uh, this is the first time there's just been no women. Um, and I think it's, um, I, I mean, I mean, it's to me it seems a big mistake. Um, I think it's possibly because um, this calculus of loyalty and demonstrating, you know, fidelity to the sort of particular Xi Jinping, um, you know, kind of aims means that people he's got a personal link to, and mostly men, you know, when he's worked in the party, the party administratively, you know, I think it's what, 80% men, 20% women. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's obviously, he's obviously never worked with uh, women cadres who he trusted enough to, uh, you know, kind of elevate them. Um, I find the diversity of this leadership to be pretty awful, really. If you think in the standing committee they are all from the ages of 60 to 69 they're all men they're all han um they're all very very kind of similar backgrounds party positions as i said very narrow um and i i kind of again this is the weird thing about china uh, today that this extremely complicated rich and diverse story and yet it's presented by these politicians who are the complete opposite I mean, how does that work? I, I would assume it wouldn't work. Uh, but I, you know, obviously the people right in the center think that this kind of thing will work. So, well, reality will see what, you know, whether they're right or not. And our final question tonight is from uh, Bjorn Gerberg, who's uh, the China correspondent for Swedish Broadcasting Radio. Um, the question is, I wanted to ask about the personality cult around Xi. How will that develop during his third term? I mean, I think it's um, here to stay and it will probably intensify. I mean, I think because the leadership structure as an institution is the way it is, I mean, the politics of this, um, you know, kind of project is that there must be a centralised, you know, leadership um, figure. And they are, in a sense, the only ones that can have any charisma. <laughs> you know, it's a kind of monopoly of charisma. Um, and no one else can have that. No one can deflect from, you know, she. so I mean, 10 years ago, 
when uh, these leaders emerged, you know, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, I thought there would be sort of like a balance between the two because they had previously pretty, you know, kind of clear different personas. But Li Keqiang has, you know, been a great story of, you know, being basically pushed into the background. Um, and I guess the strategic reason is you've got to have highly simplified, centralized, you know, kind of leadership with a capital L, and she is the leadership persona. Um, I mean, I think that therefore this is just going to intensify and it will really intensify if there's an economic downturn. You know, it's going to be Mr. Xi, you know, kind of President Xi basically leading the, the kind of great fight back, the nationalistic fight back. Um, we are just going to live in a world saturated by Xi. It's going to be everywhere. Um, and I um, don't really see an, uh, you know, kind of any, any reason to think that that's going to change. Um, uh, you know, I guess the only thing is that um, the, the problem is the outside world obviously finds that this sort of thing is very, very irritating. So, you know, it's going to be more decoupling in a way because you've got a kind of narrative in China, which is all about one person, a narrative out China, well, a narrative in China, which is all about how one person is just great and amazing, and a narrative outside of China, which is about how they're absolutely appalling and terrible. I know neither narrative is right, okay? So people that want to try and sort of sit in between and mediate a bit, um, uh, they're gonna hire, they're gonna find this a very tough and sort of slightly schizophrenic world. Very true. Um, all right, well, thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, the book is called She, A Study in Power. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you being here and hope to see you again soon. Great, great to see so many old friends on the on the call. And I hope to be able to see you all in person at some point. Uh, if not this year, then next year, if I can get to Hong Kong. Great, thank you for hosting me. And, and thank, thank you so you much. much. Thanks for, everyone. Such a great audience. Cheers then, bye. Have a great night.